Welcome back to Integral Calculus. In this video, I want to walk through some properties of logarithms. Specifically, I want to review properties that you've probably seen in previous classes and show you how these properties tie to the definition of the logarithm we saw in the previous video. So let me get my head out of the way and I'm going to get started. I'm going to call this a theorem because I want to prove to you something that you probably already know. The natural log of a times x is the same thing as the natural log of a plus the natural log of x. Multiplication inside of a logarithm can be rewritten as addition outside of a logarithm. And I said that this was a theorem because I want to walk through and prove it. And the proof I'm going to use is not exactly straightforward but I think you should be able to follow it without too much issue. I'm going to start by taking the derivative of each side. The derivative of the natural log of ax and the derivative of the natural log of a plus the natural log of x. Well, for the first one, it's actually the harder one, taking the derivative of a natural log. The argument goes in the denominator, ax. The derivative of that argument goes in the numerator. The derivative of ax is a. Then from here, my fraction reduces because there's a factor of a in the numerator and in the denominator, and I get 1 over x. For the second one, it's a little bit more straightforward. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, so we separately differentiate natural log of a and natural log of x. Well, a is a constant, so the natural log of a is also a constant, and the derivative of a constant is 0. Then the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, and of course 0 plus 1 over x is just 1 over x. The reason that I wanted to go through this is because we now have a couple of ways of writing an antiderivative. We know that the indefinite integral of 1 over x dx, I mean, sure, that's the definition of natural log, but I just showed here that the integral of 1 over x dx, well, one antiderivative is the natural log of ax plus some constant c1. I've also shown that we could use this to write, well, one antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of a plus the natural log of x. And then, to get the indefinite integral, you'll need to add some other constant of integration, c2. The important thing here, c1 and c2 do not have to be the same, but they have to exist, and they have to be related such that the natural log of ax plus c1 has to be the same as the natural log of a plus the natural log of x plus c2. We know that this is the case because they are both the antiderivative of 1 over x. Right? They're both the indefinite integral. And you can't have two different possible ways, uh, two per different possible answers for the indefinite integral, but you can certainly have two different ways of writing it. The next step is probably the weirdest in the whole process. I want to evaluate this expression when x is equal to 1. That gives me that the natural log of a plus c1 is equal to the natural log of a plus the natural log of 1 plus c2. 
But of course, the natural log of 1 is just 0. And because we have natural log of a on both sides of the equation, we can subtract it from both sides, canceling them out, and we get that, oh, those arbitrary constants that I said were probably different are not different after all. They are the same thing. From that, going back here and saying that these two arbitrary constants are equal to each other, well, subtract that constant from both sides of the equation, and we get that the natural log of ax is equal to the natural log of a plus the natural log of x. It is a required consequence of this weird integral definition of logarithm, which is probably drastically different from how you've seen logarithms defined in the past. I think that's the first proof in this course, but if you've had me for previous uh, courses, I've gone through this in those classes as well. Uh, at this level, I don't expect that you can come up with a proof like this on your own. That's not my goal in the course. My goal is that as I show you the proof, you should be able to understand and digest it. Line by line, you understand what I'm doing, you understand that what I'm doing is mathematically valid, and you can see that the argument has given me the result that I claimed at the statement of the theorem. All right. So I'm not going to go through the others. You can go through very similar looking proofs to show these other properties, but let's just go ahead and list out the properties the way that you usually see them. In general, natural log of a times b is the natural log of a plus the natural log of b. Natural log of a over b is natural log of a minus the natural log of b. And the natural log of a raised to the b power is b times the natural log of a. All right, up next, the natural number e. If you want to, you can memorize that e is approximately 2.71828. Uh, when I was a student, my professor forced me to memorize that. Um, I can't imagine why that is useful. Even when I was a student, I had access to a calculator that had that programmed in. I just hit the E button and it spit out 2.71828 and a couple more digits beyond. But the definition here is that the natural log of E is equal to 1. Right? That is the definition of E. E is the number such that the natural log of E is 1. I mentioned when we first established the natural log, that one of the things we were looking for was an inverse function. And so this natural number e does give us the inverse function. Uh, the exponential function of y is defined as e to the y. And if y is equal to the natural log of x, then x is equal to e raised to the y power. We will explore the exponential function in a good bit of depth later on in the course, but for right now I just wanted that quick reminder to you, this is a thing that you have seen. And the reason that I care is, well, what if we wanted something other than e?
Well, if we want to deal with the exponential function a to the y, then we can deal with the logarithmic function log sub a of x. In terms of calculus, log base anything other than the natural number is completely useless. But depending on your particular field of study, some of the others are more useful. Right? In the study of chemistry and a lot of the branches of engineering, the common logarithm, log base 10, is the one that is useful, hence the name common logarithm. If you're studying computer science, the binary logarithm, log base 2, is incredibly powerful. Uh, but if you're studying mathematics, it's the natural log all the way. Uh, if you're studying statistics, same thing. I'm not going to worry that much about the details, but I do want to at least show you the relationship between the natural log and the other things, because the natural log behaves well with calculus, and if you're dealing with something else, you need to be able to get there. And my disappear button isn't working. My up here button wasn't working earlier. I hope my keyboard's not dying. Anyway, the idea here is we're going to figure out how to make this work by taking logarithms. If I take the natural log of both sides of this equation, I will get the natural log of a to the y is equal to the natural log of x. Or, written another way, using the properties of logarithms we just talked about, y times the natural log of a is equal to the natural log of x. Here I'm going to look at it in a couple of different ways. First of all, I can do something very silly, and now let's just raise this back to the e power. e to the y natural log of a is equal to e to the natural log of x. And the natural log and the exponential are inverses of each other, so we get that e to the y times natural log of a is equal to x, and of course, substituting back in our definition that's at the top of the screen here, we get that e to the y times natural log of a is the same thing as a to the y. All right, this is the calculus definition of some other base raised to a power. Taking that same point and branching off a different way, I could write that y is the natural log of x divided by the natural log of a, and then using this definition of y, I can write that log base a of x is the natural log of x over the natural log of a. Right. This is the calculus definition of logarithms of other bases. If we want to try to do calculus with these things, we're going to go to one of these two formulas. We'll get into hows and whys of that in a future video. For now, let's just focus on the properties of the logarithm and playing around with those Wrote that backwards. I wanted y to the fifth, not 5 to the y. All right. So what I would like you to do is take a few minutes and remind yourself how the basic properties of logarithms work by taking this expression, natural log of 3x squared over y to the fifth, and expanding it into the simplest logarithms possible. All right. Take a couple of minutes, work through that one, and I'll see you in the next video.